but thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction. Well, welcome to all. Actually, I'm going to be your host for this panel. We have two wonderful guests who will be much more interesting than me. Today, we talk about why open data matters. So using two real life applications from two different contexts, we will explore different ways our community can benefit from open data and what impact it can have. We will also see how to make this data accessible and useful to end users. Without further ado, let's introduce our guest speakers. He is the head of open data and open government at the cabinet office and has worked on digital policy, open data and transparency for over 10 years. For the United Kingdom government, we are pleased to welcome Sam Roberts. Hi, Sam. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Welcome. He is an engineer specialized in geospatial technologies and has been working for the Meteorological Service of Canada for the last 17 years. Over the past decade, his work focused on enhancing open data services, and he is a lead for the geospatial and open data systems team. Let's welcome Alexandre Leroux. Hi, Alexandre, how are you? Bonjour, thanks for inviting me. Well, you're welcome. Uh, let's start with you, Sam. First, well, let's start the presentation. I don't see the presentation. Can you see it at home? Sorry, maybe it's the Oh, the view. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much. So first question for you, Sam, can you describe for us what you do for the UK government and what is your open data strategy? Thanks, Marie. Absolutely. So I, as I mentioned, uh, I'm the head of uh, open data and open government policy here in the UK, uh, in the UK government, in the cabinet office. And so my job is to kind of work across government, work with departments, but also work with civil society groups and people outside of government to look at priorities around open data, around improving the quality of the data that we publish in government, but also improving the kind of context around that data and also looking to try and involve voices from outside in the prioritization of the data that we release. So that's broadly what, what I do. Uh, the, 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 the presentation seems to be missing from the screen again. <laughs> so I don't know where that's gone. Um, but just to say, uh, you know, we, we have a, a national data strategy here in the UK, which we published uh, last year. Um, and so that contains within it, within it a number of mission areas. So a number of priority areas and open data sits within the third mission is around improving government's uh, use collection and kind of uh, and, and standardization of data so that's very much our open data policy um, and it's something that we've been developing over a number of years as i mentioned uh, and something that we're kind of implementing now so uh, so yes that's me well so you, you're pretty busy <laughs> it is why i, I understand uh, now can you tell us more about your famous covid19 dashboard Absolutely. So yes, this is something that I think is a very relevant uh, case study to kind of highlight. So obviously, the last 18 months for all of us in the global community have been have been absolutely overwhelming. It's something that I don't think anyone expected to uh, to kind of take a over. And a really important element of managing a, a situation like a pandemic is obviously gaining and maintaining public trust and really kind of demonstrating the decision making process that we've been going through and, and helping the public understand, uh, you know, the, the kind of the scale of the issue, the size of the problem, and also the kind of reasoning behind some of the some of the kind of decisions that have been made around things like lockdowns and, and restrictions and stuff. So. This is a kind of a, this dashboard is something that we've been developing here in the UK. It's a, it's a way of being able to see at a glance all of the open data uh, around the coronavirus and, and the effects it's been having. So things like vaccination rates, uh, mortality rates, things of that nature. And it presents uh, progress of the pandemic as an authoritative summary. So really important that we put this information out from a, a trusted source, which is obviously for us is, is government, um, but also, you know, providing updates at a national and local level to ensure a good understanding of, of how, our, uh, how our measures are being implemented and also what the impact of those measures right. are. So, you know, really, really important piece for us and really important for us to maintain public trust by, by, uh, by showing things in this way. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of people got interested into uh, open data during the pandemic. So how would you say this project was help helpful for your strategic plan? I think for us, it really demonstrated, uh, you know, this is the national data strategy here. It really demonstrated how data can be made available and meaningful to the public. So uh, we often find, you know, there are issues in government around data sharing, issues around publishing data to a good standard. 
what we find in a crisis situation is that all of those problems tend to melt away. So we're able to actually move more quickly. There's a real need to get things done. And so we actually managed to overcome many of those barriers. So we've been able to demonstrate the need for open data to gain public trust and also demonstrate the process of government decision making, but in a way that's actually directly related to a real life event. So improving the quality and availability of data can be extremely complex and extremely expensive, but in a crisis scenario, we have to, and that means that we can then yeah. use that as a precedent to do more work later on. So really important, this piece of work in terms of, I guess, exemplifying and with data in a, in a situation that really needed it. Well, so at least the situation was positive, like regarding open data, at least. <laughs> so can you tell us maybe something about the other projects your team is currently working on? Absolutely, yes. So we're extremely busy all the time, as you can imagine. Um, there are a few big yeah. things to point out. Um, firstly, you know, procurement uh, is, is a big area. And again, the, the pandemic has really highlighted, uh, you know, how how challenging it can be to do mass procurement within, within government. So one of the things that we're doing in the UK is we're looking at the options around our procurement regimes, looking at increasing the amount of data available about government contracts, and also adopting more kind of open standards standard that's collected around procurement. So again, making it easier to follow the money, making it easier to understand how government money and public money is being spent. Um, second thing I wanted to highlight is uh, beneficial ownership. So again, very much a kind of financial angle to this. So we're creating an open standard for beneficial ownership data. So that will help us with combating fraud, tracing money laundering issues and things of that nature. So a really important piece. And again, we have blogs on this. I'd, I'd urge everybody watching this to go and have a look at the work we're doing and, and, and contribute to that. It's all on GitHub. So it'd be great to kind of get some, some views. And then finally, uh, government strengthening its digital leadership. So we've, been, we've created a new organization here in the UK, the Central Digital and Data Office, or CDDO for short. That is a new organization that is leading the digital and it's focusing on standards, governance and policy for data specifically. So really important that data is finally being given its own prominence, not just lumped in with other areas of digital policy. And so again, you know, a real kind of signal that we're looking to strengthen that leadership and really address those underlying issues with data in, in the UK. Thank you, Sam. Well, all of those projects are like super complex. That's a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Now let's see what, uh, what Alexandria has to say. First, Alexandre, can you describe for us your career with the Meteorological Service of Canada and what you do now for Environment and Climate Change Canada? Yes, of course. So I've been at the MSC of the Meteorological Service of Canada for a while now. Over the past 10 years, uh, I've been more focused on uh, our various open data services. Uh, especially the web services in my case. So those services are mission critical and operational 24-7. They get tens of millions of data requests uh, daily. So it's actually very exciting work. It goes well beyond how we dress in the morning. We have examples on that slide. I could have added the hurricanes and tornadoes in there. And I'm feeling privileged uh, to contribute to uh, me at making the Earth system modeling data uh, available to the world. Well, the, the scale of what you do is really impressive. Well, can you tell us more actually about the climate data? Of course I can. So uh, obviously we have a lot of climate uh, climate data services we, we provide to the, to the public, to anyone who wants it. It includes things like uh, data archives, uh, climate uh, simulations, scenarios, and so on. But uh, what I wanted to share with you is uh, one of the collaborations we have with uh, our numerous uh, users and partners. And one of those partners is climatedata.ca. Uh, it's a, actually a very, very good example of um, a partner integrating the alternative data that we provide to the public and they're integrated in their own tools uh, through those standards. And uh, they actually provide services tailored uh, to specific industry sectors or specific public needs. So uh, it's a, a very good example from my point of view. And all of this is possible thanks to the uh, interoperable uh, uh, services and standards. Uh, so uh, Climate Data SCA has one very good example to us. Mm. So you work with like a lot of ever-changing data. So how does your team make sure that the available data stay current and relevant? <laughs> That's a good question. 
actually indeed uh, the data never stops coming in every second so uh well staying uh, relevant it's easy in our <laughs> for us uh, in a sense where um it's actually crucial data there's not that many uh locations in the world where uh, the weather is forecasted uh, operationally and uh, we also have we're lucky in canada where we're amongst the best weather and environmental forecast models uh, in the world so we're very lucky and we're happy to make it freely available to everyone and of course to remain um, relevant and current uh, there's everything uh, either the importance of uh, data governance and, and the, 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 the various good data quality processes of course uh, but I, I would say that data is worthless if it's not easily usable and that's where mm -hmm. uh, the fair data principles are absolutely crucial and fair essentially being findable accessible interoperable and reusable and that matters big time and of course we need to support users through uh, user documentation various examples we do have uh, we do provide this to the public and we keep improving it uh, very regularly and um, so the, that that i think helps us remaining current and relevant and of course uh, i must mention as well our, our long-term uh, exchanges and data exchange with the, the WMO. So that's the World Meteorological Organization under the United Nations. So we're one of the contributors. And there's a, in order to, to, to forecast the data in Montreal, you need the, the, the data across the entire globe. And that, that data exchange is done through the uh, WMO. And so we're pretty much involved on that front as well. Thanks. So there is potentially like a lot of data usages you can get from from these data. So are there any other projects or data usages you would like to share with us? Yes, yes. So um, in, on remaining on the same team on the climate data, uh, we have numerous data sets, as I said, related to data. Uh, one of them is the long term climate extremes. Uh, which we provide with a modern standard, uh, the OGC API feature standard, but essentially it allows anyone to easily compare observations with climate extremes. Uh, the second example I wanted to share is, is because it's, made, it's by far our most popular data. Uh, the, those layer alone gets a tens of millions uh, of its daily. And um, so it's the North American weather radar MASI. So it time steps every 10 minutes across uh, all North America. And there's a renewal a radar renewal in progress uh, across the entire country in Canada, and we also I uh, won't announce anything today, but uh, we're, we're uh, we'll be adding more uh, radar data services uh, over the coming months, hopefully. And uh, what what is currently provided is, is uh, the web map service in order to visualize animate radar data very easily. And the third and last example. Uh, I actually like it a lot. That's a, that's a, um, where we were in support of uh, one of our numerous partners and, and users, which is uh, Dakar in Senegal, as part of the severe weather, uh, severe weather <laughs> forecast program. So basically, we help them. They have relatively low capacity. We help them integrate our open data into their tools for their own needs. And actually, the beauty of it is that it's free. The data is free, of course. But they don't need any storage. Basically, they just needed to build an HTML page, which was loading our data on the fly, and they could visualize it, customize it the way they want. They can change the color scale of the various layers and so on. So I think that example, I like it because it demonstrates how the low barrier to open data matters big time. Well, let's talk about accessibility. This is a really, really good example. It's really light, logis logistically speaking. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Now I have a few questions for you both. Uh, first, what would you say were the difficulties you met uh, making data available to the end users? Uh, let's start with you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very challenging. As I mentioned earlier, I know Alexandra also alluded to these issues of interoperability 
quality data use. For us in the UK, certainly managing and collecting data in the right manner is, is really important. Um, and we the, we the things that we've had to overcome have been things like a lack of, of, of overarching data standards, lack of in, a data governance in that respect, uh, infrastructure not being interoperable, legal and cultural issues to data sharing and inconsistent levels of capacity within, within the civil service. So the things really have been not just about legal or, or technical but also cultural and it's been really important for us to kind of bring our senior leaders and our kind of colleagues with us on that data journey to overcome a lot of these issues it's not just about having the best data scientists and the best technical people in the room mm -hmm. you need a lot of uh, a lot of, uh, of partnerships and what about you alexander is it is it similar in your case what difficulties did you mean well, uh, I think I'm going to focus a bit more on the practical uh, challenges we faced. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I want to say also a few words uh, regarding the upcoming challenges uh, we will be facing in the future, such as serving petabytes of archive data, data cubes, going to the cloud, of course, ensuring our data is AI ready, and so on. But in practice, uh, for our uh, data services, weather, uh, climate, water, environmental. We, we have tens of millions of files that, that get refreshed uh, very regularly, almost on a daily basis, or every second that come new data. Uh, we have thousands, uh, 8,000 uh, special temporal layers. Uh, that means that there's a mix of real time. Uh, we have uh, multiple temporal dimensions, which we don't see often in other data sets. We get because it's very geographic, weather is geospatial by nature. So weather, weather and climate, of course. So uh, we also use, because of, the, because of the modeling on the supercomputing infrastructure, uh, we have rotated grids, tripolar grids, multiple poles, and so on, you know, unusual formats. So the, those are, <laughs> geospatial data ends up being special after all, it seems. So that and is part of our, our challenges. Hmm. So there are a lot of issues, both on the on the human high level and on the the very practical side. And well, what did you, what did you do to solve those? This is, of course, what we want to know. First, let's go with you, Sam. What did you Thank do? Thank you. Um, it's an ongoing thing. It's not something that we've actually been able to fully fully crack just yet. But but I think it's worth sort of saying a few things. So first of all. We've created a new organization here around data standards uh, within government. So we mentioned earlier the issues around quality, availability and data access. We've got teams dedicated specifically to looking at those issues now. So we are looking at open standards. We are looking at enforcing those standards and we're also tying those standards to things like uh, government spending. So you need to make sure that you're using the right standards in order to get funding for the projects, which is important. We're also working with our leadership. Uh, working on capability across governments and making sure that we have the right people in the right roles that know how to use data, how to create data and how to kind of maintain data. So really, really important on that side. And then finally, really, really important is around the ethics and public trust element to this. So we've been kind of working with, as I mentioned earlier, stakeholders outside government, trying to learn from best practice that's happening outside of government and actually, mm -hmm. you know, developing plans based on best practice that we're seeing from other industries and from other places. So we think that it's really important to combine all of these things to try and address these issues. And we're seeing some some early results that are very positive, but um, but it's a, a long-term culture change piece and something that we'll be working way, way after all of us have finished working on, on government data. Well, and hopefully all the, all the people like viewing this panel will be as well able to use the best practices you just shared with us. So thank you. Thank you so much. And what about you, Alexandre? Did you find any magical solutions you would like to share with us? <laughs> well, it might not be magical, but uh, I'll stick uh, once again on the practical side because we're lucky where uh, the open government, open data policy is already in place. Uh, the operational infrastructure at the Metropolitan Service is fairly solid. So, uh, but the challenges we faced, as I pinpointed in, in a previous comment, where uh, it, it all about uh, how special the data can be, especially whether data that comes out from the supercomputing um, infrastructure. Well, uh, the, the solution I, I wanted to share uh, is uh, how open source software has been key to us. And it has really nothing to do with, with money at all. Uh, it's really all about uh, development flexibility. 
uh, because uh, we get new data sets which have, uh, as I said, maybe a sp specific grid, strange grid, unsupported by classic software. And we need to be uh, very quick in adapting to those uh, realities where, oh, new we, we, we're facing, you know, we get new data that is, uh, <laughs> might be strange and unsupported by most uh, software. And then we were able, thanks to open source software, to, to uh, quickly adapt our systems and deploy them operationally. And um, saying a bit more about this uh, contributing to the open source ecosystem, uh, we're very happy because we're not only benefiting from uh, the uh, directly our, our dissemination systems directly benefit uh, from the larger community, but uh, the other partners uh, which jump in the bandwagon, well, actually the UK Met Office uh, is one of our partners where they contribute to to this to the same software code that we use, and there's the, the Americans and uh, ECMWAF. Those are the European European uh, weather agencies and so on. So we're we're very lucky where we're all helping ourselves in an extremely efficient way, and uh, this help solves real issues we have with our open data dissemination systems. It's super interesting to see that like first you are super agile technologically speaking so you can like gather all of these data and then and make it useful and it is actually useful for the community which brings me to my last questions what do you think uh, are the key elements we need to ensure that open data are actually used by the community not an easy question let's go with you alexandre okay thanks well on the technical technological point of view uh, I would say that um, the fair data principles uh, still remain uh, central uh, to uh, answering that the community actually used the data. So I, I'm going to repeat them very quickly. It's findable, it's all about metadata, uh, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and so on. So basically, with a relatively small set of standards, so the ones from ISO, the ones from the Open Geospatial Consortium in our case, uh, well, they, they allow us with a small, relatively small set of standards and small set of uh, underlying software, uh, feed websites, mobile apps, uh, specialized tools, all at once, which are fairly low barrier to access and use. So those fair data principles are clearly core. And uh, of course, none of this uh, could happen without uh, the, uh, the, uh, all the various policies at higher levels, such as the open government, open data policy, the permissive, uh, permissive the open data li licensing, which enable industry or anyone to create and sell value-added products, and which directly multiplies the value, the social and economic value of Canada's open data. Mm -hmm. So a lot of doors have to be open and aligned properly, so, so it works. Um, Sam, would you, would you like to add something? Any other key yeah, elements? Com completely agree with Alexandre's uh, examples there. Ab absolutely right. I think from, from my perspective, in, in 2011, 2012, when we began our open data journey here in the UK, we were really focused on just publishing as much data as possible. If there's data in government departments that isn't being used, as long as it's not personal or in any way sensitive, then publish it, make it open, give it an open license and, and, and put it out into the world. I think that was fine in the early days, but I think things are a lot more sophisticated and nuanced now, and we need to have that feedback loop. We need to speak to people. We need to understand what open data is being used for. And we need to make sure that what we're publishing is being is being, is being being useful for people. So mm -hmm. for me, the, the values of open government are key, transparency, accountability, and public trust. Those are the three key things that open data helps to engender. And so what we need to make sure is that whatever we're putting out is, is meeting the needs of various communities. It needs to be meeting the demands of various communities. It needs to be of good quality. And so for, for our perspective, working with our communities, working with civil society and, and charities, understanding what open data can be used for, and then really investing in making it uh, good enough quality to be used is, is, is the key thing. And we found much more uptake and usage uh, through, through that approach. So that's, that's certainly my, uh, my key takeaways. Well, quality, it's, it's a big question. You know, it's all about the concept of value, but 
what is value it really depends on the point of view you take but well you seem well uh, on the on the way with the question well our time is already up it's really quick right so sam alexandre thank you so much for your presence today and the precious knowledge you have uh, shared with us you showed us very concretely that open data matters and there is still much work to do so it can have even more impact on communities so good luck with the rest of your projects Thank you as well to everybody who's watching and don't miss our next panel in just a few moments. Les données ouvertes, ça change pas le monde, sauf que see you very soon. Welcome to those who are still with us. I will be your host for the next discussion. Today we're going to see how open data can change your world and we're going to be using different contexts and we will explore how open data can have an impact on our communities and how our communities can benefit from them. We're also going to examine accessible and useful data. Without further ado, let's meet our guests for today. We have with us for the Ministry of Transportation and for another department, she is her name is Sophie Leblanc. Welcome. And one of the few journalists who knows how to code in Canada and Quebec, he responds to the major public interest questions. He's a journalist at CBC Radio-Canada. Let's welcome Niall Shab. Hello, and thank you for the invite. Welcome to our panel. Let's start with you, Sophie. Can you describe to us in a few words your work at Transit and tell us about the company? It's a mobile app created in 2012 by two Montrealers who wanted to digitize schedules to help them get around the city. We're about 30 employees and Transit Mobile is one of the most popular apps for public transit with a million users in many cities. We want to encourage transportation without the use of a car. So we have different options, the bus, metro, rideshare, service alerts. We have information on accessibility. We want to give the user the best tools possible. So we are the link between the public sector and transit companies to make the experience better for users, whether it be for improving data or integration of services. I do what I can to create partnerships with transport societies, companies, so we have a partnership with over 80 companies. I like the app. I have it on my phone. Do you want to tell us more on the app and how you use open data for the app, since that's the topic of today? The interpreter would like to note that the participant's sound is very poor. There are data standards that allow this to be possible, and we need data standards. For example, the GTFS standard allows transit companies to share information, real-time data, and it shares this with developers like Transit, Google Maps, and any other company that would like to use it. The standard is still in development. And we're adding features and there's GP and there are other tools for cycling and we are working towards the creation of these standards because it allows us to do our work transit develops and designs the app we have an itinerary calculator we have user support and we've been developing new functions. Your business model is based on 
open data. So you have open data that comes from a lot of sources. How were you able to make this profitable? It took us a lot of time. We've been in business since 2012. We've had investors that believe in us and see our impact on people who take public transit over the years. We were able to elaborate a business model that today is based on a few elements. The application is free, but we integrate additional paying features. For example, we can choose a personal avatar, you can change a the theme, but for all user, we offer a free subscription. There's also other custom integrations where there's no open data, for example, integrating the um, for ticketing and other through the API. And then we have industry partners to share data that help them understand how people are moving. With all these this data, well, some data is open data, and you also have private data that you're using. How can you do you uh, mix those two types of data? As mentioned, with the app, we can manage data that we can reshare with our public partners, for example, uh, trans uh, transit uh, organizations. This data goes back to them for private data on public transit. Data is very public, but there are some uh, transport uh, modes like um, like the uh, scooters don't share information the same way as public transit. Our capacity to offer all mobility options to users is limited because the change is from one city to another. It reduces um, integration. By, for example, if we compare emails or uh, Facebook Messenger for emails, there's there are tons of uh, email uh, platforms to do so. But with Facebook Messenger, everyone's using the same platform. That's one of the issue with private and public mobility. Recently, we've uh, ri uh, written a guide. The link is uh, on this image. We try to explain what data is available, what data is missing, and what steps can be taken to make that data available. There's there are a lot of puzzle pieces. Adaptability, we've heard in the previous panel, that theme is recurring for all stakeholders. Thank you, Sophie. Let's see what Nael has to say. On, He's a journalist, not on the business side, so he has a different point of view. We can't wait to hear what you have to say. Can you explain what a, a data journalist does? Data journalism is is a quantitative journalism. So I'm looking at things in a quantitative way rather than be only interested in one event or individual. I'll try to have data on all events, all individuals, and we try to uh, get trends. For example, the image I'm showing is of planes that come to Canada those play, all those planes land in Canada. I've analyzed a million of uh, millions of flights uh, during the pandemic, rather than focus on one plane that might have a COVID case in it. I'm looking more at general ten, uh, trends. I use algorithms and dat open data to answer public interest questions. There are some long-term projects, for example, uh, information on COVID. I maintain that at uh, CBC, but there's also analyses and um, 
investigations. Transparency leads to confidence, so I try to make uh, accountable pub different public in institutions. I share data that I uh, collect or that I group together. Transparency is essential in my work. This is why I'm so happy to have been invited to an open data summit. It's essential for this transparency is essential for this concept of open data. So there are different types of things you do. Can you describe some of your accomplishments? Absolutely. I have three that I'll show you on the screen very soon. I've tried to find projects that show different aspects. For example, the first one, I'm, sh I'm soon that it's going to be on the screen. It's a uh, an investigation of my colleague from uh, CBC, Valérie Wallet, on Airbnb. We've noticed that on Airbnb's website, you can look for uh, um, units without being connected to the website. We've looked for these accommodations in different cities. We noticed that the uh, Airbnb uh, server to show uh, showed us longitude and latitude, and we tried to see if there were Airbnbs in zones where they're prohibited. In blue, you see the zone where uh, Airbnbs are allowed, and the red ones are where they're not permitted, and most of the Airbnbs were found outside of that zone. So we had private data, just like any um, internet user. And there's also open data for the zones where Airbnb are allowed. And that was in April 2019, soon after the rules changed in Quebec. Second project was completely different. It was published recently. It was on diversity of federal election uh, candidate. There's currently an election campaign in Canada. It's a mix of open data on uh, funding that candidates got, candidates that, uh, that these, this data is available uh, through StatsCan, and also data from um, the parties. Is that a white or a racialized or an indigenous candidate. So I tried to see what resources and which writing these people were according to their ethnocultural identity. It's an, so there was an analysis and visualization aspect to this project. Third project I was published in July. It's on vaccination uh, rates in Montreal. Government of Canada has, of Quebec rather, has data on vaccination, but it doesn't go into very, like in, the, in very much detail. I try to find public information that people should know about at the a source at the um, uh, public agency gave me access to data on vaccination at a granular level in Montreal. I've decided to publish that information. That's part of my work is to make sure that institutions are accountable, try to find information that's not in open data, but maybe I can seek a different way of, open, of accessing that information or obtaining it. Your work can um, talk about difficult aspects. Have you had issues in your work? Yes, there's always obstacles or barriers. My role is not to please. Sorry about the phone. Access to data is complicated. Access to experts can be complicated. With private businesses, I can easily have access to data or to their experts, 
but data can be quite delicate. On the university side, I can easily speak to experts, but access to data is more difficult. And with public organizations, both are difficult, access to data and access to experts. Because the questions I uh, want to answer can be politically sensitive. So there's confrontation and confidence. I try to show that my work is serious, that I'm not doing just about anything with this data, and that when there's uh, personal or confidential data, I will uh, respect uh, privacy as a journalist. I don't have any interest in uh, going over that. When there's something that's politically sensitive, I try to find sources or use certain laws like the act that uh, on information from public institutions that forces them to give me the, the data. Access to data is at the core of what you do. Is it the same thing for Sophie? So we're not at the, the next round of questions. Do you think at the transit you have access to all the data necessary to reach your objectives? You said that a few were missing, so what would you like to have on public transit? For private companies, it's something else. That's why we're uh, focusing on that aspect. If there's a lack of data, we create data. For example, we'll use our users in some cities to understand where uh, ent entrances of stations are. So, for example, is their bus is full? Are there uh, sitting us? Are, are there seats available or not? So when we, there's no data, we try to collect from users. Now you've talked about that already, but what would you add on access to data necessary for your work? In my field, there's information control by institutions. When the topics are delicate or sensitive, we don't. they don't always want to give us the information. On open data, there's a lot of information available, but data is filtered through a, a political and institutional lens, and sometimes uh, I feel like more could be done. What could help you with your work on access to data? Sophie, first, what could you could make your life easier? Sophie, actually, Sophie's not here right now. Nell, what could make your work easier? First of all, I'd like to um, give a shout out to people who work on data, on open data. Transparency is not it is a con continuous effort in public and private institutions. A lot of work is done to publish open data and accessible formats with metadata. So I'd like to uh, talk about that, but there are also acts and uh, regulations that need to be reviewed. There, notably, uh, the act for access to public documents that would force institutions to publish information when uh, people are asking for them. As a journalist, having communication agents or relations in the government, in you know, private companies that are specialized is important. I want them to understand what I'm asking for. I, like when I say, oh, I need this kind of database with in this format. Can I talk to your analyst? They should understand why it's important. I'd like to shout out the work at StatsCan. They, they have people that are specialized to speak with people like me who have all these uh, uh, competencies or that are seeking data. So there's a confidence relationship that is created. Sophie, would you say the same thing? What helps you in your work with regards to data access? Sorry, I think my internet blocked for a while. I missed a little bit of the presentation. What's important for us 
is to have more standardization. It improves availability, it helps innovation, uh, uh, elaboration of laws. There's also extra con consultations to uh, with uh, users of the, those data are a bit lacking. It would be important to keep in touch with the actual users of the data. So we need a contact within the organization or they could try to see how the data is used and how the data can be improved. Last question before the end, have you had examples of information sharing that could uh, lead to changes in the community. Nael, during the pandemic, an example I've had in mind is COVID, COVID and schools in Quebec. There were initiatives in other places in the country. Olivier de Rouen decided to ask parents to send him emails that uh, schools were sending when a COVID case was uh, tracked at a school. So with crowdsourcing, he was making that information um, available automatically. There's also the International Consortium of uh, Investigative Journalists. You've probably heard of Panama Papers, that is a group of journalists in, on, in the world that share data and work on uh, different projects together. There's collaboration between different media, which is a great thing. Also in my team, we try to be as transparent as possible. We try to share all our data, for example, data on COVID from that's uh, uh, collected from the country. We try to share all that information on our um, main board. If people find mistakes, it helps everyone. This way it can be corrected and the report can then be corrected as well. So it all has to do with networks and confidence. And Sophie, do you have something to add? On my side, in mobility, a very interesting example is the Act on Mobility in France. Under this Act, there's a national access point on mobility data that was created. It's transport.org.gouv.fr. They're helping with uh, quality control and visualization of data, among other things. What's interesting is that under this Act, this year, there will be a legislative framework on the business side. How can private companies uh, interface with different mobility offers? It's a very interesting model. It was created by a public entity in Europe, in, um, in Belgium. There's an act that requires micro mobility operators to integrate in at least three third party platforms. So we've seen the legislative and the relationship act uh, impact. That's all the time we had. Thank you, Nair and Sophie, for being here with us and for sharing your different experiences. We were able to get to know uh, different universes. There are still a lot of challenges. Good luck for uh, the future. And thanks to everyone who's been here. And don't miss the rest of our program. I wish you.